and we move to our time of offering. And it, 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 it seems strange to me that some churches don't do the offering. I don't know if you realize that, that some churches have kind of been removed from things, uh, often because it seems to be a distraction, it seems to be a, a commercial break. Um, and I think that's a little unfortunate. I, I believe that our offering is a vital part of our worship. It's not just paying the bills. Uh, it, it certainly does that. Don't, don't get me wrong, I mean, it's needed for that. It doesn't just support mission causes. It does that, and it should. But it sets our, our heart on the things that are important. It's a time to pause and not just be a spectator, but be committed to the cause of Christ, the cause of the church. And not, not limited to the, the local church, but the church, the work that the church does around the world in uh, so many ways. I, I would say a variety, but variety doesn't nearly do it justice, the way the church ministers. And so it's a way to participate in that with committing ourselves. I mean, let's, let's face it, it was just as easy as um, our offering being uh, setting up a credit card payment or a, a bank draft, which is good. And I know many people do that, but then never talk about it. Um, it, it it's kind of like getting that gym membership in January, having it on your credit card and never going to the gym. Um, I think we should focus as part of our worship on a time of offering of giving ourself. Uh, it's also why I use frequently the, the phrasing of tithes and offerings beyond the tithe. Uh, that we're not looking to find what's our minimum, what's our tax rate. We're looking to find how can I give myself to the ministry of the name of Jesus Christ. And so with that attitude, we bring our gifts, we bring ourselves, and we dedicate these things heart of our worship. Let's pray. Holy God, thank you. Thank you for all that you have done for us, the many ways you have touched our lives, for the way that when we were still in sin, Jesus came to die for that sin. While we owed a debt, he paid the debt. And in gratitude, in humble appreciation, we offer who we are what we are, the things we have, to the work of that name of Jesus. And so we bring before you tangible gifts and the intangible. We bring before you monetary gifts and spiritual gifts. We bring time, talent, and treasure and offer all of these things that you would use them, that you would use us in love, mercy, grace and compassion to share the name of Jesus, the name in which we pray. Amen. Our hymn this morning, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus, hymn number 560 if you're using a, a hymnal from Scotch Plains Baptist, also included in your worship packet, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. <laughs>
as we move to our time of pastoral prayer, praying for and with one another. I encourage you to continue to keep your own prayers, to jot things down. Uh, perhaps um, you get the email that often follows the service that lists some of the prayer requests that have been shared aloud um, uh, here at the, in the sanctuary, uh, or uh, those that have been shared by email or text message that have been compiled. But certainly you have other things that you've heard, and perhaps some things that you might have shared with one or two people, but you haven't shared publicly, and perhaps they've done the same. So you might think that, oh, everybody knows that because so-and-so asked me to pray, but they might have asked you to pray. Um, so make sure you, you kind of keep that list, uh, particularly if you've encountered somebody and said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll keep that in prayer, or I'll be praying for you, or if you've seen something on social media and you responded with prayers, but you haven't prayed, or you put the little praying hands, make sure that you continue to keep those things and pray over them. In just a moment, we will pray together, and you'll hear my voice, but know that there are many hearts combined in that prayer, and that it is not the pastor's prayer. It's pastoral prayer, our care for one another. Let's go together in prayer. Holy God, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus, for salvation, for the many blessings that have come into our lives. Particularly in the month of November, we seem to be more inclined to talk about those blessings, to count those blessings. We create a season of thanksgiving around the day of thanksgiving. And at our best, we recognize that thanksgiving shouldn't be limited to a day or a season. And so we come to you ticking off the blessings that we have received. Knowing that even if we were to take pen to paper and list them all, we would surely miss more than we list. And so we ask, Father, that you see that it's our attitude. It's our desire. It's our intent. To be a thanksgiving people. And so we praise you for the good things that you have done. For the lives that you have protected. For families that you have nurtured. For illnesses that you have freed us from. Financial struggles that you got us through addictions that in you have been overcome. We continue to give you thanks. But Father, we're realists. And we recognize that not every sickness has been overcome. Not every addiction has been conquered. Not every relationship has been restored. Not every medical report is positive. And that realism could become discouraging. Could become frustrating. Could embitter if we allow it. But we choose to be a thanksgiving people. We choose to recognize that the blessings that come from you outweigh the things that burden us. 
and that above all else, we are grateful for eternal life through Jesus Christ. An undeserved gift. An eternal gift. While our trials may be temporary and fleeting, and our days on this earth may quickly pass, we acknowledge that you have given us an everlasting gift. And in light of that, and in spite of, contrary to, in rebellion against the things that torment us and give us stress, we declare we are a thanksgiving people. And we continue to praise your name and say, Thy will be done. And we mean it. And we say it not with stooped shoulders and kicking the rocks at our feet, but we say it with uplifted hands and smile upon our face because we know that your will so far surpasses anything we could imagine. We praise your name and give you thanks in all things. Hear now the prayer of your people offered in the name of your Son. Amen. It's a challenge at times, isn't it? To be an appreciative people. To be a thanksgiving people. It's a challenge at times to have, as my father so frequently said when I was a child, an attitude of gratitude. Because we're more likely to be stumbling and grumbling. I think that can easily become our default position to be a complainer. To point out all the things that are going wrong. But because of Jesus, we can adopt a new attitude. We could put away those things of the flesh that are self-centered, that look at me, that say, oh, woe is me, and put on the things of the Spirit to say, look at Jesus. How blessed am I? Even in very challenging, very difficult, and frustrating circumstances. We, when we put on Christ, can overcome our natural inclination to be frustrated, angry, bitter, complaining. That we can stop looking at the success of others and put a mirror on ourselves, complain. We can stop looking at the healthy relationship that somebody else has and stop complaining about ours. See, because we, we have that tendency to compare. And to complain that it's just not fair. Why is it that? I, I just recently watched a, a YouTube video of a, of a couple that I actually I follow some stuff they do on YouTube. And they titled their clip, The Struggle is Real. And they talk about how there are folks that will comment on the things they do and will say things like, well, it must be nice when you can do it. Oh, it must be nice then. And they kind of made the point that when people say it must be nice, they're not saying it's nice. They're not saying, oh, well, that's nice for you. They're saying, well, that's terrible for me. It must be nice that you can have the time to do that. I don't have the time. It must be nice that you can get out and do that. My, my health doesn't allow me to do that. It must be nice that you have family and friends that will do this for you. What they're saying is, I don't have that. Things aren't as good. It's said with a, a note of bitterness. And what the couple were saying in the video is, this struggle is real. And just because you see 
some positive stuff here doesn't mean that there's not some negative stuff that you're not seeing. And I, I've noticed that this guy, every time he starts a video, tends to say, it's a beautiful day here, or what a day here, or hey, it's a great day, it's raining right now, but we need that rain, what a good And that his attitude is what's nice. That it's not the things that are around him that make the difference. And I think we can choose which person we're going to be. The one saying, hey friends, it's a great day. Or, it must be nice if you're having a great day. That's up to us. We choose which we're going to do. We kind of fit that cartoon image of the angel and the devil on either shoulder speaking in either ear. And we get to make a decision of who we're going to listen to. What voice we're going to hear. We have the choice whether or not we're going to listen to Satan or say, not today, Satan. See, Jesus doesn't promise us that everything is going to be good and perfect. Matter of fact, when we listen to him carefully, he said it's not going to be good. Doesn't say there's not going to be a burden. But he talks about his burden is light. Doesn't say there's not going to be something that you're going to be yoked to, but my yoke is easy. In me, it gets better. So when we start to think that, you know what, because I'm in Jesus, I should automatically be living right, that everything should be great, that, it, that the fairy tale endings should be happening. We're probably. At that point, not living in him so much as we're living in our own dreams and desires. And so when we look around and see what other people have and complain about what we don't have, we start to get to what must be nice. Well, I think Jesus wanted us to understand that it wasn't always going to be nice for us. But that he would be there with us. I mean, let's face it. In the past year and a half, and I'll just let you fill in the blanks. Not just fill in the blank, because there's not just one blank in the past year and a half. But in the past year and a half, but Jesus has been with us. He goes through with us. Through the valley of the shadow. The scripture that we look at today could have a tendency to take us in a multitude of directions. And we've looked at this scripture together in the past and have gone in different directions, but there's a, a certain path through it that I want to look at today. Now, our scripture comes from Mark chapter 13. And this, this picks up kind of where we left off last week. If you, if you remember, uh, if you were with us last week, we talked about that widow's might. Remember about the whole, what the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the leadership do, and how they, the, the, um, the righteous people puff themselves up in their prayers and in their giving from their, their bounty. And about how this woman came and gave, as Jesus said, her living. Yeah, that might have been just that day's wages. It wasn't necessarily that she emptied out her savings account. It might have been what she had it for that day. Kind of like if, if um, you've ever had this experience that you're in the parking lot at, at Home Depot and somebody comes by and, 
hey, uh, can, you, can you help me out a little bit? I, I, I need to get... Or you're at the grocery store and somebody is saying, I'm sorry to bother you, sir. I'm sorry to bother you, miss, but um, I need to get diapers for my kids. Can you do a little something? And you might literally pull out your wallet and empty it of all the cash you have. That doesn't mean you empty your bank account. And perhaps when this woman put in her two small coins, Perhaps it wasn't in her entire life savings, but it was what she had for the day. And maybe that meant that she wasn't going to get something to eat later on. Maybe there was something that she would have to put off a little longer. But she gave what she had. Sometimes you've been in that position, haven't you? Where you know what? Next week I will have more time. I'll have more energy. And right now I am at the edge. But you give what you have. You give the last drop from that reservoir. That's, that's, that's hard. Even knowing that, yes, there's, there's rest on the other side of this. There's renewal on the other side of this. Sometimes we want to hang on to that last little bit. You know, I am... I am dog tired and I am exhausted. I just taking the half hour to do this is gonna deplete me. But what an offering it is to deplete yourself on behalf of someone else. This conversation we're gonna look at here in the Gospel of Mark, the 13th chapter, comes right after Jesus was pointing out the dichotomy between the wealthy giving huge gifts that only amounted to a little bit and the poor, the widow, and how much of the teaching is about taking care of the poor, the vulnerable, the widow and the orphan, as she gives her two coins. After this, Mark gives us this next snapshot. As Jesus was leaving the temple, right after that conversation, as Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Right after talking about pomp and ego and vanity and trumpeting your gifts, broadcasting your bounty and comparing it to this humble woman giving out of her meagerness to then walk out into the sunshine and see those massive stones, see that magnificent temple and to boast about it. I mean, if that's not missing the point, How ironic that this disciple wants to talk about architecture. Verse 2, the reply from Jesus, Do you see all these great buildings? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. See, buildings speak to us of permanence. Massive stones speak to us of in domination. Nothing can come against this. I mean, this isn't the three little pigs building a, a house out of straw and a, and a house out of twigs. Or even a house out of brick. This is a massive building. Beautiful Sturdy, strong, a symbol to all the people when they gaze upon it. And Jesus said, yeah, you're enamored with this? And you think it's something? Not one stone will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Now, it might be easy to overlook the poor widow. Given the last of her sense to that offering. 
It might be really easy to overlook her and be lost in the majesty of this building that's going to endure. She's just a little blip. She's not even, not even a footnote in anybody's history. But look at this building. And Jesus said, this building will not last. Mark doesn't insert here the phrase later on that evening. But he could have, right here between verses 2 and 3. Because we do get a movement from the area of the temple to as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite it the temple. Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately. Now it's interesting that Mark doesn't list who was the one, doesn't give us the name of who was talking about the building, but here he gives us four who came to him with this question. Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be And I got to tell you, this is where it's easy to get caught up in the signs that are being talked about here. Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nations will rise up, nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must be first be preached to all nations. Mark doesn't have here that Jesus says, if you are arrested, he says, whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time. For it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. See, it's easy in there to start counting up signs. Part of it is because we, we kind of hope that what's been going on for the past year and a half We kind of want to hope that the wars, the earthquakes, the famines, that these are signs that things are wrapping up. And we're ready to get out on the other side into the victory, to go through the valley of the shadow of death and then rest beside still water. But Jesus tells us, watch out, but don't be alarmed. You must be on your guard, but do not worry. Be aware of these things, but don't give in to them. He also points out these are the beginning of the birth pains. It's just the beginning. Now every generation has seen those things. I mean, there are folks who are hearing this, who run out of fingers on one hand to count the wars that they've been alive for. And not just, I mean, that's just talking about American wars, let alone all the other wars, let alone the other nations versus other nations. Some of the stuff that we haven't been involved in. And the earthquakes, and the floods, and the mudslides, and the fires. Many of you have lived through already several 100-year floods. 
And it's easy to say, well, it must be the end time is coming. Every generation has seen these things. And there have been persecutions of Christians. And we here in America, when we want to talk about how there's a, a war against Christianity, we don't even begin to glimpse what in some other nations the war against Christianity is like. As we sit in our comfortable churches with no governmental authorities checking IDs before we come in. Nobody writing a list and reporting it back to a headquarters that we need to keep an eye on. No mobs coming to burn down our buildings. Drag worshipers out of home Bible studies. Every generation has seen these things. And so if Jesus isn't answering their question about signs and when these things are happening, what is he telling them? He's telling them that there are some signs and things are going to be bad and they're going to be bad before they get better. You're going to go through bad. That there's no generation that just because they are followers of Jesus are going to avoid the bad. But watch out. Be on guard. But don't be alarmed. Don't worry. And even in these things, the gospel must be preached. That even in dark days and difficult circumstances, the gospel will be preached. And just maybe, sometimes, because of the dark days and the difficult circumstances, the gospel will get preached and people will hear because in the good days you didn't think about it and in the good days I don't need to hear it. But in trial, in tribulation, on those rough patches when you need something, perhaps you're ready to hear it. Perhaps it's not until things get dark, you realize you need a light. Yesterday, my daughter and I were coming back from snowshoe practice, and we, we pulled into a fast food place um, that was not fast food. I timed it to 23 minutes from the time we pulled into the line before we got at the drive through And as we're pulling out, trying to get onto the road, I see in my mirror somebody waving their arms behind. And I put down my window thinking this guy needs some help. And he's like, you have a flat tire. So I don't know if it went flat when we were sitting in that line because we weren't on the road, we didn't feel it. And it was, I mean, it wasn't a low tire. It was a flat tire. And this was after the first big wave of rain had come through in this area. And we'd gotten drenched out at our, our, at our special Olympics practice. And now I'm outside the van trying to figure out where's the spare tire on this thing and what seat do I have to move and how do I crank this down and I'm on the ground in the mud, or not the mud, the water, pulling the spare tire out from under the van and Ashley's in the van and she says, you're going to get some help. Now, she wasn't like an inspired prophecy. She saw somebody coming across the parking lot. And this guy comes up and he says, what you got going on? And so I got a flat tire. And he's like, which one? And the sliding van door had kind of cried. He said, oh yeah, you're, you're in bad shape. He said, you got that? I got him pulling the spare tire. I said, yeah, I got it. He said, you need any help? I said, no, thank you. I appreciate it. He said, you have a tire iron? I'm like, yes. He said, well, I got a power one. Let me go grab that for you. Oh, okay, thanks. I didn't realize that where we pulled the van over, it was facing a service station. Not a gas station, but a, an oil change place that does some other stuff. And apparently, 
they had nothing going on, and he happened to be, I, I think he was out having a smoke break and saw us. And he came back with tools and a hydraulic jack instead of that little scissors jack that's packed into the back of my van. And he's like, let me get that for you. And he takes the tire off, and there's a huge chunk of metal stuck in it. And I had to spare out and get ready to put it. He said, don't put that on. Let me fix the tire for you. And he took it back over and put a plug in it. And while he's dealing with the tire, there was somebody else there who wasn't doing anything. So they worked on it together. The one was kneeling inflating while the other one was patching it. And he came out and he put it back on. And I went to put the spare in the back. He said, well, no, no while I'm here, let's, let's get that put back underneath. And he helped out. And I went, I asked him, how much do I owe? He said, nothing. I said, well, yeah, you could. He said, no, I, I like being a good dude. I said, well, I appreciate that. I want you to take this and, and take care of your partner. And, and I got in the van and Ashley asked me so we could tip him. <laughs> I'm like, yes, Ashley, I, I did. She also, while he was gone back to get his equipment, while I was continuing to undo that, uh, locking lug, she leaned out and she said, it's good to know there's still nice people in the world. You know, I don't know this guy, I don't know who he is, I don't know his name, I never saw him before, but when I needed him, he was able to be there. I have probably, if not thousands, at least hundreds of times, driven past his establishment, and I could not have told you it was there. But when it was dark, he thrived in the light. When there was a need, the help came from a place I never would have expected and did not know. Jesus gives us this description of wars and famines and earthquakes of trial and persecution and standing before governors and kings warns us about it but says don't be alarmed and don't worry. As a matter of fact that maybe part of that is going to help get the gospel preached to all nations. So yeah, maybe when you're going through it Maybe when you're saying, well, it's not fair that this after this after this after this after this has been happening to me or to my family, to my church, to my nation. When you say, yeah, the struggle's real and I'm, I'm done. I can't go any further. Jesus says, yes, it's going to come. You should be alert for it. Be ready for it. Be prepared for it. But don't worry about it. The next little bit gets a little grimmer, even. Brother will betray brother to death. And a father, his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. All right, if you're looking at our worship packet today, I put that in bold, I blew it up bigger, and I underlined it. Because sometimes we start to think, well, because I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm going to get all rainbows and fluffy clouds and angels playing hearts, and it's all going to be great. He says, everyone will hate you because of me. I mean, that's not the prosperity gospel that some people are signing up for. Think, well, because I'm a nice person and I try to do the right thing, that that should just draw people to me. Everyone's going to hate you because of me. Now, the next word is a tiny word. Three little letters. But... The one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Get 
to the end. Get to the end. Stand firm. Yes, they're going to hate you. They're going to want you to deny me. They're going to want you to buckle under pressure. Be on your guard. Watch out. But don't be alarmed. Do not worry. I'm going to be with there. The Holy Spirit is going to put words in your mouth. And when you stand firm at the end, you will have won. It's not going to be easy getting there. It's not going to be comfortable getting there. It's not going to be smooth sailing getting there. But get there. I don't know <clears throat> when things are going to get better. Frankly, I don't know if for you things will get better. Isn't that a terrible thing to hear the pastor say? But I know this, that at the end, Jesus. And it don't get no better than that. We don't have promises of rainbows and puppies. We have promises of wars and famines and trial and persecution. Being called upon to give a defense. We have the promise that the Holy Spirit will be with us. And at the end, those who stand firm will be saved. When I was doing some looking up some commentary, some background on, on this passage, and reading what some other people have thought or said or, or written. I came across a quote from Winston Churchill during World War II. It said, when you're going through hell, keep moving. And as I read that, it struck me. I know what our sermon title is going to be this week. Because there was a, a country song back in 2006. Rodney Atkins. It went, it went to number one on the country charts for four weeks. Only made it to number uh, 33 on the Billboard Hot 100. But the year-end country chart actually made it the number one hit. Rodney Atkins sang a song, When You're Going Through Hell, Keep On Going. Now, it kind of got him a little bit of trouble. I mean, it made it number one, made him a hit. But apparently his son was singing that song in school and kept singing it. And the teacher really didn't like the elementary school. He got this kid running around singing about going through hell. So he got called in. He ended up writing another song that was the number one country hit for the next year, Watching You. Then in the song, he's gone to a fast food place with his kid, slammed on the brakes, and the kid's french fries went flying everywhere, and the kid might have said some inappropriate language. And the father was shocked that this little boy knew such language. He said, well, I've been watching you. And in that song, Rodney later is praying, God, let me be a better example for my son. I let him down. And this is what it did. And then that night, he walked by his son's bedroom door, and the son was in praying. And he said, son, where'd you learn to pray like that? He said, don't you know, Dad, I've been watching you. So this song that, that became the title for, for today, I actually debated using it because I know there's some people that would, might be offended about titling a sermon if you're going through hell. But I think those who are going through it need to hear, keep on going. Here's how, here's how Rodney sang this song. Oh, and he, and he probably combined it with the lyric from an old Irish blessing uh, that may you be in heaven five minutes before the devil knows you're dead. He doesn't even know to come look for you because you're already in heaven. Might have combined that to get this song. Well you, well, you know those times when you feel like there's a sign there on your back 
that says, I don't mind if you kick me. Seems like everybody has. Things go from bad to worse. You think they can't get worse than that, and then they do. You step off the straight and narrow, and then again, I know that some of this isn't going to apply to you good church folks, but you step off the straight and narrow, and you don't know where you are. Use the needle of your compass to sew up your broken heart. Ask directions from a genie in a bottle of Jim Beam, and she lies to you. That's when you'll learn the truth. If you're going through hell, keep on going. Don't slow down. If you're scared, don't show it. You might get out before the devil even knows you're there. He says, I've been deep down in that darkness. I've been down to my last match. Felt a hundred different demons breathing fire down my back. And I knew that if I stumbled, I'd fall right into the trap that they were laying. Yeah. But the good news is there's angels everywhere out on the street. Hold not a hand to pull you back up on your feet. The ones that you've been dragging for so long, you're on your knees. You might as well be praying. Guess what I'm saying? If you're going through hell, keep on going. Don't slow down. If you're scared, don't show it. You might get out where the devil even knows you're there. I think Jesus could get on board with those lyrics. Even the part about the Jim Beam, because Jesus knows that, as for some people, have been looking for help. You know what? When the demons of that are reaching out for you, he's ready to pull you back. He'll be there with you when you're ready to come home. I think Jesus would understand that. I think the people that he hung out with in his day would have understood those lyrics exactly. I think what he was saying to his disciples when they're talking about these massive stones and this beautiful building, he says, this is all going to come down. And they knew what he was talking about when the kingdom comes, it's going to rebuild and he's going to do something different. They, they knew the language of, I can tear this down and three days later build it back. But Lord, when's it going to come? What's the sign? How do we know? He says, there's going to be all sorts of signs. Don't you worry about it. You just stay with what you know. Stay with me. Don't let those signs scare you. When you're going through hell, when hell's coming to you, you just keep on going. And in the end, those who stand firm will be saved. Stay with me through the valley of the shadow. And you'll be with me on the other side. In just a moment, we're going we're gonna to sing a hymn that I've I got to be honest, I'm not real familiar with. It's been in our hymnal. It's actually been in our hymnal the whole time we've had the hymnal, surprisingly enough. But I don't know that we've sung it. It's entitled, I Would Be True. And this was written by a young man when he was serving as, a, uh, as an English teacher in Japan in his early 20s. And it Face it, let's face it, in a demographic, that, that young adult where a lot of young people kind of move away from their faith. And he wrote this, and he called it my creed. And he sent it to his mother. He said, this is, this is my plan. This is, this is what I lay out before me. It's kind of my goal statement for life. And then he had a friend that, that put it to music. If you're looking at it in our worship packet, it has six verses. Our hymnal only has three. It only has the first three. The first three were, were written by uh, Howard Walter. The um, second three were wit written by a friend of his, Samuel Harlow. Um, we're only going to sing the first three. But the, sec the, the, the second group of three are, are worth looking at as, as kind of a, a devotional or reflective. Um, and I will say, if you're singing from the hymnal, if you have the hymnal at home and you hear, and I'm sorry when sometimes you have to hear me singing, if you hear me singing on that third verse, I'm going to be singing some different words that you have in the hymnal. These are the only ones that I can find printed in a form that I can share in the worship packet. And that third line um, in the worship packet, we have, I would be faithful through each passing moment. Um, whereas in the hymnal, it's going to say, I would be prayerful. And then some other little changes and another 
um, line that's a little different, and that's okay. This is written by a young man who's far from home, far from the support system that he knew, probably facing some challenges. Now, maybe not life and death challenges, maybe not wars and, and famines, maybe not earthquakes, but probably a cultural earthquake, a different setting. And he writes this down about how he's going to stand. And I think it's a good one for us to read. And whatever our earthquake might be, whatever tries to shake us and we want to remain unshakable because we stay in Christ, I would be true if you're using our hymnal, it's hymn number 493. We're going to again sing verses 1, 2, and 3 from the worship packet, the only three that are in the hymnal. I would be true. Let's sing together. to do this. 
that there's no government agency out there looking to interrupt our signal or, or wipe it away from the internet. I'm glad that we can talk in the valley about the mountains. That we can talk on dark days about the light. And it's my prayer that we'll continue to look for that light. That we'll stand for it. That we would be true. And in the end, it's all Jesus. Receive the benediction as you go. Go faithfully walking the path he trod. Go. With Jesus at your side, even through the valley of the shadow of death. In war, famine, struggle, and earthquake, be unshakable. In the name of Jesus, be a blessing and be blessed.